is nourishing. Oh, oh, are you still there? Yes. Uh, other <laughs> I just the on. Oh, good, good, good. And and it's just really nourishing, you know. So uh, so I'm really grateful for it. And uh, uh, and I I really you know the other thing I really appreciate about you personally is you seem you know very joyous. You seem very happy, and and uh, you seem to really exemplify you know what it is you're talking about. And uh, I, I wish that wasn't as quite as rare as you know what i experience you know and i've been around the block a couple times i don't i'm not the most dedicated practitioner i don't you know i don't do a uh, a retreat a month or a whatever but i've done a few I've, you know i've i've lived in zen centers and i've i've done some practice over the years but i i really um uh i really appreciate you know your your dedication, your your joy, and and I'm watching the thing. The, the uh, uh, I'm still uh, watching the um, you know, the uh, recordings of Alex, you know, and, and just really enjoying that and your your dedication to that. And it's just it's really uh, really helped me. So really been beneficial. Okay. Well, there's several things that can be said about. Um, some of the stuff that you're you're talking about. Let's start this way. Most Westerners who come to Buddhism, they don't come to the real teachings of the Buddha. They're not available. What they come to is Western Buddhism. Mm. And Western Buddhism has a whole lot of Western ideas about what Buddhism should and ought to be. And so you'll find a lot of Westerners who become teachers. They try to present themselves as stone statuary. Mm, mm, mm. Because that's their idea of the Buddha. Yeah. Okay. In the time of the Buddha, there were three symbols. One was the Dhamma Chakra or the Dhamma wheel. The other one was the Bodhi leaf from the tree. And the third one was a picture of a representation of a tree with a sit, a seating place, an empty seating place under it. It wasn't until Greek um, uh, influence in India that statuary ever became part of Indian culture, mm. starting at around 300 BC period of time. And all of a sudden, there's a huge amount of statuary Buddhist and otherwise that spring mm. up in India. Mm. Mm. OK, and mm. so this the uh, the icon of a sitting statue of a Buddha did not exist until about 200 years after the Buddha. Mm. Interesting. Mm. And that most of the statues that they had at that time were also not in the sitting posture but in all of the postures all together so that it was mm. just one of four postures and so there's a lot of asian lying buddhas or reclining buddhas statues mm. mm -hmm. there is also a lot of statues of the tudong monk now the tudong monk is actually it's a it's a, a picture of a walking monk except that he's walking with all the paraphernalia that the monks would use to go camping Oh. You could say, in fact, say that the, the possessions of the monk is nothing but 2,500-year-old versions of modern camping equipment. Mm, mm. The robe itself is the tent. Mm. Also, mm -hmm. they would have a um, uh, an umbrella, but the umbrella always has a hook at the top of it so that the pole can be taken out to where with us, we think of the umbrella as the pole that is carried with the umbrella rather than taking the pole out and using the umbrella as a tent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yeah. the Tudong monk is going to have his bowl, his Sangati robe and his umbrella. Mm. But the picture is of him walking an active uh, piece of statuary. Mm -hmm. You also have a few statues, a lot of statues, actually, of a, of a standing Buddha, but almost always they have it with the handout mm. like this. 
mm. the radiating hand is put uh, out. And the idea is, is that you put your attention, your mindfulness, your awareness on the uh, on your hand as if it were radiating joy, love, uh, supersonic vibrations, magical mm. Um, uh, uh, um, X-rays, anything like that, but okay. that's how that's how you hold a hand out with your awareness uh, on that place. And there's a lot of statues for that. But huh. the Western mind has gotten the sitting statue, and that they think mm. that to become a Buddha, you got to sit mm. without recognizing that if you see those Buddha statues, every one of them has a slight smile. Mm. A smile on the face of the Buddhas. Mm. That's right. the part that is often missing. Yes. Is mm. that smile. Okay. Mm. And then um, there's many different talks that I've had with people about it uh, where the actual Mahasi Savadal and what he taught is mm. not what has become the Mahasi method in the West. Not the same mm. thing. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they always leave a few pieces out. It's mm. almost like this. Every deck of cards eventually becomes not a deck of cards because one or more cards turns up missing. And yet many people will continue to play with the deck of cards, even though <laughs> some of the cards are missing and they may or may not even know that there are cards missing or that which cards are missing. Mm. OK, mm -hmm. that's yeah. what's happened to Western Buddhism. In fact, you mm -hmm. can think of the teachings of Buddha as very much like a puzzle. Let us mm. use the example of a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And the way that we uh, do jigsaw puzzles is we start looking at the pieces, noticing the colors, and eventually we get some colors together and try to fit the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Western Buddhism has two problems with that jigsaw puzzle. One mm. is is that we don't really have a good picture of what it is that we're trying to put together. In fact, some mm. of the most difficult jigsaw puzzles, the whole thing is just black. There is only one color there. It's all black. It's a great big puzzle, and you've got to figure out how to do it without seeing any of the colors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Western yep. Buddhism comes like that because even though there's colors are there, we still don't know what the picture is. We don't know what we're looking for. Everybody's got their own ideas of what a Buddha is, and almost always it's got influences from Christianity. So, so true. we put the Buddha up there with Jesus. So true. So true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so the jigsaw puzzle has another problem other than we don't know what the puzzle is that we're trying to put together, and that is, is it's got pieces missing. Mm. Yep. Yep. It's like Leroy Brown. <laughs> He's like mm. a junkyard dog with a couple of pieces gone. Yep. Yep. Right? Yes. That's the problem. Well, what pieces are missing in the jigsaw puzzle? Joy. Mm. That's what's missing in the Western because, in fact, we take uh, Buddhism and try to turn it into something that we already understand, which is Christianity. Mm. And Christianity is based upon suffering. And then if you suffer enough, then you'll get forgiveness. You'll get grace. Mm. Allah will have mercy upon you rather than justice. I've had enough justice now. I want some mercy. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. That's not what the teachings of the Buddha is about at all. Buddha is not going to save your ass. He's not yeah. going to. Neither will yes. Jesus. Neither yeah. one of them are saviors. What they are are examples of what you could be doing yourself. Go save your own butt. And does this lead us to the idea of gladdening the mind? Is that mm -hmm. where this goes? Is that what you're, you're ultimately uh, leading um, a student to, is to gladden the mind? Actually, there are four things. Okay. And that we could say that when we have these four things, then those combine together in a whole to make something new. Mm, okay. So there's a fifth thing, which is okay. the product of the four things that we put together. Okay. And that once that thing is now there, manifest that fifth thing, it has characteristics or attributes. 
Mm. And if we define those characteristic and attributes in three ways, then that gives us four plus one is five plus three is eight. This is the Eightfold Noble Path. So okay. We have to think of it as a four, one, three combination. Okay. And and yet, uh, uh, being fair, we try to divide um, uh, the Eightfold Path into three, mm. which I yeah. just did. And yeah. then I, in fact, I, I put it into the three is wisdom, the four things, giving samati, the fifth thing, mm. which then brings about right livelihood, right effort, excuse me, right speech and right um, uh, action, which is now the sila. So panya samati sila is the mm. method that we practice. And mm. yet most people hear the Eightfold Noble Path is Sila Samati Panya. Mm. Mm. You start with the Sila, you get your act together, then mm. you get your mind together, and then you can see correctly. We're mm. doing all of that backwards. Mm. Are we doing it backwards or, or would you say it that it, or, or would you say that it's something that takes place at the same time, like all of these elements work together? Well, that's true if it's correct. Mm, the okay. problem is, is that when people are ordinary people, they start with the precepts. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yep. And if we think of it correctly, we're actually saying that the precepts is the outcome of a mind that is whole and noble. Mm. Mm. A mind that is satisfied. A mind that is satisfied. A mm. mind that is noble, a mind that is whole. And mm. if the beginner student is lucky, that means that when he remembers to be uh, correctly behaved, whatever it is, that he's in the process of telling a lie and he shuts his mouth or something like that, is mm. because at that particular instant in time, his mind became noble. Mm, because sati. He, right. The sati to remember, which sati, by the way, is one of the four. So let's start with, with that and, and, okay. and work with it this way. Okay. Sati right. is the first thing. Without sati, without remembering that we can change, we can't change. Yes. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is to really do an investigation, to look at what's going on. To be honest with ourselves in our investigation and not an investigation of in the past, but an investigation of what's happening right now. How do I feel? What am I thinking? Mm. What's really going on right now is yeah. to be investigated. Okay. And anything that is happening right now could be improved. Okay. So what we're investigating is what can we do to make an improvement with this? Is this good enough as it is, which is often the case, or mm. can we do something to fix it, to make mm. it a little bit better? Mm. This is the investigation for wholesome versus unwholesome thoughts, so that we mm -hmm. can see the thoughts are unwholesome versus thoughts that are wholesome. If we, if we wake up and recognize that the thoughts that I'm having right now are wholesome, Yippee! Right. Okay, we got it. Yeah. If we wake up and recognize that this thought is not wholesome, now we take the right effort to change it, to fix it, to make it more wholesome. Right. And may I ask a, a question? Um, Go ahead. You just uh, did, so. I know. I just don't interrupt. Um, when you talk about wholesome, are we talking about what is true right now? What is great about this moment and what I'm experiencing that's satisfying for myself? You know, I'm breathing, I'm safe, I'm, you know, all of the things that are not a part of what you, like you said last time, what's dangerous about the past, perhaps what's dangerous about the future. So unwholesome becomes really more about what's unreal and what's imaginative and what isn't true, but we fear or we we resist or we, you know, reject, you know, this kind of thing. And that wholesome becomes 
uh, becoming, uh, I think, friendship is something you've spoken about, embracing, you know, uh, not only what we don't like, but, uh, you know, but what is our, what is sort of the fuller experience of our life as it is right now? I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't mean to take over the conversation. I want to listen to you, but I really want to understand this idea of wholesome and unwholesome. All right. Let's go into that. Okay, let's go into that. The first thing that we can say about it in the sense of hindrances is a hindrance is anything that's going to keep you from feeling the way that you want to feel. Mm. Okay. Most people don't even know that they have a choice about how they want to feel. And so they've never investigated. What would I feel like if I wanted, if I could feel the way that I wanted to feel? How would you feel if you could feel the way that you wanted to feel? Yes, I know that. I can tell you that right now. I want to feel satisfied. I want to feel at peace. I want to feel like there's nothing left to be done. That's right. exactly how I want to feel. So my wife. Any, <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything that prevents you from feeling that oh, way. Oh, excuse me, Dom. Excuse me, Dom Morado. I'm sorry. Gwen, just take it off. Take, take it off the top. Uh, will you excuse me for one moment? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not. Uh, uh, here, let me do it. Let me do it. I got it. I got it. Uh, here we go. Good. Is that better? It's good. Okay. I'm so sorry. This is our, uh, this is my first um, call it. She's already in bed. She's asleep. My wife's asleep. So. I, we didn't realize I didn't realize she would be uh, disturbed by our conversation. So excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the question is, if you could feel the way you wanted to feel, yeah, how would you feel? Now, the hindrances are anything that will hinder us from feeling the way that we want to feel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would, would um, I mean, I don't want to feel dissatisfied. I mean, I'm really not. Would you say that, you know, we're not really making a decision about how we don't want to feel. We don't want to feel dissatisfied, right? I mean, you, well, you know what I'm saying? That's the whole point is people are not thinking and making that decision. They're yeah. not looking at what's going on. They go yeah. ahead and feel the way that they started to feel without recognizing that they have a choice. Right. And the choice is to choose to um, uh, uh, to embrace um, thoughts and experiences that are wholesome. And wholesome experiences are, are that which does not generate dissatisfaction that which is not generating this uh dukkha wholesome experiences are generating uh sukha are generating uh, experiences of satisfaction just like you were kind of catching me in our last conversation you're like oh uh you don't want to be late right <laughs> i think i was thinking about that right you were kind of like calling me on that if i'm not mistaken and you were saying oh you don't want to be late you know and so there's a dukkha there whether I'm late or not, there's a little dukkha there. I'm doing that to myself, right? My hand is on the the stove, and I'm I and I'm and I don't have the good sense to just take the hand off the stove, right? Exactly. Is that so? Is that so? Exactly. That's the whole point. That in fact, okay. being late is just setting it up so that you can make a grand entrance. <laughs> right. Right. You right. get everybody's attention when you go in late. If you're early, then <laughs> you're part of the crowd. Yeah, so, but I mean, but I think what you're saying is, is that you know, it, you know, is that we're generating our own dukkha. I mean, the Buddha is talking about the fact that how we think and how we feel is, you know, directly related to whether or not we're going to acknowledge a wholesome or an unwholesome thought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's those are two things that are deeply bound up together. In in the sense that we have a choice 
about how we feel if we know we have a choice about how we feel. And if we don't know that we've got a choice about how we feel, then we wind up feeling the way that we would ordinarily have felt. But once we start waking up, we recognize that we do have a choice. Now, no. that's in fact a way of looking at the second noble truth. The whole point of the second noble truth is to recognize our own personal responsibility. Dukkha mm. does not happen because he shot me. Dukkha mm. happens because I don't like that he shot me. The two darts. Yes. The first dart is the unimportant one. Yeah. But it leashes the second dart, which is the one I don't like what he did. Yeah. Okay. And so now we feel bad. That's the hindrance. Yes. Other people don't make us feel bad. We choose to feel bad based upon what they said. Yes. And when we w- and the process of waking up is to recognize that at any moment we've got a choice about how we're going to think and how we're going to feel. This is what the practice is all about. Mm. And every new moment is new, mm. which means we have the opportunity to remember to act as if this is a new moment, but mm. we are in such a habit of the past that we mm. treat this, this moment as if it were the same as the old moments. Mm. Yes. So we live in the past, dwell in the past, and we don't see that the future is different than the past. Yes. But if we see this present moment as a brand new moment, it's a new opportunity to feel the way that I want to feel. Yes. And when you say that, you're not saying that like it, you've said that in other uh, conversations that I've watched, you're not speaking to the fact that that's an affirmation. You're speaking to that as as the fact that that's a truth. You know, the, yes. the way the way that I want to feel is not about how I want I, I would like to be like I would like to be beautiful or thin or a millionaire, but it's but about one, it's none about of those it, things are feelings. Because you could be a millionaire, and there's a million different ways a millionaire can feel. Yes, he can feel jealous. He could because he doesn't have two million. He can feel afraid because he might lose that million, et cetera, like that. Okay, so yes, that's what the problem with affirmations are: is is that they're not real. Yes, but what you're they're, talking about is what's real. What's real? Yes. What's real, or at least real in the sense of absolutely potentially available. That's As wholesome. Opposed, right. A million dollars is not e- easily a mi- available, but yeah. a bath is easily available. Yeah, or a gentle breeze that's pleasing, the 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 warmth of the sun, you know, the the the. the um, proximity of a loved one, the, the community of Sangha, these are all real. That's all beautiful, mm. right? That's all wholesome, mm. yes? Uh-huh. But the girl standing in front of the mirror saying, oh, I'm so beautiful, when in fact she doesn't believe it. Mm. Yeah. That's why she's standing in front of the mirror trying to convince herself of something that she doesn't believe. Yes. Right. And why should the girl actually even want to be beautiful? Why can't she says, I'm good enough. I'm the ugliest kid in the class. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's, you know, the thing I've been thinking about, too, is the uh, talk you gave regarding stop, you know, about the guy who was collecting fingers for his necklace. I forget the name. And, uh, and the Buddha, Buddha kept <laughs> and the Buddha kept saying stop, and then he said stop, Buddha, and he said I have stopped. Stop. And I've really been thinking a lot about that, you know, uh, in regard, you know, to what we're discussing. I mean, it's it's really just about that. It's just really about whether you decide to stop or not stop. Mm-hmm. Right. To be able to see that unwholesome stuff, I put mm. a stop to it. Mm. Now, many people will use the word in our language of suppression. We're not suppressing anything. We've stopped it instead. Mm, mm, Okay. Um, mm. uh, I guess it would be a difference between uh, being on the ground, strangling a rodent that is fiercely fighting us would be suppressing it versus Mm. just really killing the rodent. Mm, mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're not trying Mm -hmm. to suppress anything. We're just going to kill it instead. 
Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the mind moments are like that, that everything lives and dies. Everything arises and passes away, arises and passing away. Mm. So recognizing that that unwholesome thought is passing away. Yeah. And I'm going to have a new thought, more wholesome, arise in its place because that's what we're working with. So this is part of that group of four that we were talking about. Mm. And that is, is to wake up to look at what you're doing mm. and then do a course correction, make a mm. change to it. Yes. What, whatever thought that you've had in your mind, you could have a better, more wholesome thought than that, probably. Mm. Yeah. And if you can't have a more wholesome thought than this, then congratulate ourselves with the, what a marvelous thought this is. Yeah. Yeah. So. We can keep doing this practice over and over again. These three things run and circle around each other. And that is sati to wake up, uh, ditti to look, to mm. investigate. Mm. Okay, this is not a world view. This is a looking at what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the next one is the right effort. And right effort and right uh, viewing and right sati run and circle around each other, gaining um, momentum, gaining skills. Mm. And when we get the momentum going, then we add a fourth spoke to the wheel, and that fourth spoke is called in the Pali Sama Sankapa. And Sama Sankapa is attitude. Mm. 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 It's often translated as right intention, which is correct. Mm -hmm. But right thought is not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That yeah. in fact, uh, if it is a thought, it's a very, very quick kind of thought. Mm -hmm. The example would be when a tree is cut down, which direction is it going to fall? Mm -hmm. It's going to fall in the direction that you cut. Well, it's going to fall in the direction that it's leaning. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay. you cut it so that it leans in a particular direction. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. You make it weak in the direction right. that it's going to lean. Okay? Right, right. If right. you think of that, then you can recognize that that's what attitude is, is how we're leaning, because that's the direction that our faults are going to start falling. Mm. Okay. In other yep. words, this is faster than a thought. Mm -hmm. At least it's faster than a verbal kind of dialogue in the mind. Mm -hmm. It is an attitude, and that attitude comes up really, really fast. Mm. Okay. Now, okay. let's look at something that is vertical. In other words, it's not leaning in this direction, and it's not leaning in that direction, but it's vertical. Because okay. it's vertical, it doesn't have any gravity pulling it down. But if it's leaning, just like the tree, if the uh, if you cut the tree and cut it down to where it's got no leaning, it's not going to fall. In fact, the way that the beavers cut it is they cut it around and around and around to the point that it's like toothpick sticks thing like that. But as long as the tree is completely vertical, it's still not going to fall over. Ah. But it will fall when it's leaning, and it will fall in the direction that it's leaning. And our yes. mind is like that, too. So the, the mm. mind is going to fall in the direction that it's leaning. Mm. And by taking the practice of remembering to take a look and to make a change, and to remember to make uh, to take a look and see what's going on and making a change and we do that over and over and over and over again we begin to change the attitude of how mm. things are leaning mm. when we were little kids we were born as a victim we can't mm. feed ourselves we can't clothe ourselves we can't talk we can't tell the uh, the big people what we want or anything like that that we're victims we're born victims and the big people make sure that we stay victims. Right. By the time we're six years old, we become a victim of the school. We become victims of ABCs and one, two, threes and all of that kind of stuff. Kids, sit down and do your homework. Go yeah. clean your room. And so we remain victims. 
Mm. When do we ever become champion? Mm. Have to think Most for ourselves. We'll stay in that victim's mentality and they lean towards victimhood for the rest of their lives. This is one of the places where, uh, and this happens in all occasions. We're talking about music. We're talking about code writing. We're talking about martial arts. We're talking mm. about uh, uh, archery. Any skill that you learn, mm. you start off no good at it. And you know you're no good at it. Mm. Yeah. But in fact, we all need a little bit of beginner's luck. Mm. Mm. We all need that beginner's luck because what is the beginner's luck is it gives that child an attitude that he can do it. If he did it one time, he can do it again. Right. Right. And that's what we're developing. We're developing the attitude that I can change my mind. I can uh, improve. I can mm. change the unwholesome thought into the unwholesome and that means that we're now beginning to change our attitude from that of a loser mm -hmm. who has the attitude of oh meditation is hard oh i can't do it oh this is mm -hmm. difficult i don't know what they're getting out of it that's the the attitude speaking okay yes. and we change that attitude into the attitude of can do mm -hmm. That in fact, in uh, Sutta number 48, the Buddha makes the statement after a long description of hindrances and obstacles to telling what they are. He mm. then makes a statement that the first knowledge, the first step on the noble path mm. is when the student has the attitude that no matter how obstructed the mind becomes, no matter what hindrances are there, he can wake up, change that stuff, throw that out, mm. and be here in the present moment and see the reality of the situation. And mm. that's a pretty heavy-duty good attitude. Yes, liberation. A liberation that no matter how bound up, tied mm. up, restrained I am, I can get out of it. And would you say that unwholesome in, in the in this language is delusion and wholesome is reality wholesome is yes. actually our experience i'm sitting here i'm you know comfortable i have a loving wife i'm speaking with a, a dharma teacher a dharma friend i mean this is a great situation it mm -hmm. has nothing to do with anything that i would uh, be dissatisfied by but i bring dissatisfaction into my experience i introduce it or i allow it the, 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 the operative word is bring because you were already carrying it. it was what, was the what was the operative word? Carry. You use the word carry. Yes. Which means that you're bringing it with you from the past. Yes, yes, that's right. It's, it's not new dukkha, it's old habits. Yes, it is. It is, absolutely. It's not That's in right. the present moment, and the attitude is that we, uh, from that past, is when we were really little kids, up until the present moment, we were victims. Right. But we're going to change that attitude to become a, um, a champion. But we need to do that, repeating it over and over and over and over again, sort of like it uh, soaks in. You've heard yes. uh, uh, the story of, the, uh, uh, let us say, artificial plastic sponges, but the same thing happens with cloth. A terry cloth, a towel, mm. rejects the water. Mm. Even when you uh, uh, immerse the towel in water, it still rejects it so that you can immerse the towel completely, pull it out, and there'll still be dry spots in it. Or if you mm. drop water on a... Um, uh, an artificial um, sponge, the water doesn't soak in immediately. It sits mm. on the surface. Mm. There's water uh, uh, surface temp uh, tensions and all kinds of stuff like that. But if we keep dropping water on that sponge, it will begin to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is part of the quality of rep repetition doing it over and over and over and over again and keep putting more water on it and pretty soon we recognize hey part of the sponge has gotten wet <laughs> <laughs> right 
It's right. getting wet, guys. And so uh, that's when the attitude comes in is the recognition of success. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. We have to create something in the sense of doing something that is successful. And what is that? The effort that it takes to change the mind from an unwholesome state to a wholesome state. We keep doing that over and over and over again until we get that uh, beginner's attitude of, yeah, I can do this. If I mm. remember, I can do this. Mm. And so yes. we put some F's and conditions on it, then I can do this. But yeah. eventually it comes to the point of it does not matter how interrupted the mind is. It doesn't matter how much dukkha it is. It doesn't matter if they're coming in and saying, oh, your mom just died. Or maybe it's a cop wanting to arrest you or whatever it is. Mm. You can handle it and you know that mm. you can handle it. You can handle anything. This mm. is the attitude that we're talking about is the attitude of I can do it. I can handle anything. Mm. It doesn't so, matter what happens. I can handle it. I can is, handle that visa office. I can handle an IRS agent. I can handle famous mm. people. I can handle <laughs> being criticized. I can handle, you know, whatever it is. That's the attitude that we're developing. Wow, you just, tick, handle it. you just ticked down my list. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, and when we're talking about what's wholesome and what's unwholesome, unwholesome is essentially related to the hindrances, essentially related, related to ill will or how we interpret that, how we expand upon the concept of ill will. The biggest one is wanting something we don't have. Mm. Okay. I, I want something I don't have. I've got to go get it. Mm, yeah, I can't be yeah. satisfied without it. I've got to go get it. Yeah. So being in a position of wanting something that you don't have is dukkha. That's a classical definition of dukkha. It's being dissatisfied because we don't have what we want. Amen. And yet here's all of these people sitting down in meditation wanting to be enlightened. That's right. Wanting the big experience, the big <laughs> enlightenment, the, the transformation, the magic, right? You know, like, I mean, God, I've been down that road. I, you know, I mean, you have more than I have, but I, one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to what you're saying is because I've been down that road. The, the magical Buddhism, the magical this, the magical that, you know? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> well, once the magic, though, is in this change of attitude from mm. I want something, enlightenment, versus, mm. wow, this is great. This is good mm. enough. I don't know mm. what enlightenment is, but I'm not going to trade this for that. <laughs> yes. And how could that not be possible if it were true that when you read the suttas, it talks about how people would hear the Buddha and then they would, they would get it. Like that moment, they would get it. It wasn't a 20-year thing. They would get it that moment. They would see what he's saying, understand the value of it. It would penetrate and bam, that was it. He knew how to speak to somebody. He got it right to them. Mm. Okay. Mm. And they and they get to point. Uh, mm. And they understand. That doesn't mean that that person walks away all in light for the rest of his life. But it knows. Yeah. But it does point out that now he knows what to do. Now he's got a direction. Now that things are straightened out, he can figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the attitude that I can figure out. I don't know everything, but I can figure out what I need to figure out. I can handle it. Okay. Yeah. So now that we've got that down, the second statement that the Buddha makes is that this point that we get, this attitude that I can handle anything, is the first step on the noble path. Mm. This is super mundane. Mm. It is noble. It mm. is a factor of the path, and it is not held by ordinary people. Mm. 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 Most people do not have the attitude that they can handle anything. I mean, look at the number of professions that have risen up because people didn't think that they could do it themselves. Automobile mechanics. Yeah. Dentists. I can yeah. do it myself. Look at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about lawyers? And doctors. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at all the. How about Gucci? I can't live it without Gucci. 
right, 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 right. right. You got to have somebody else validating your decision and your investment. Right. And so here we're bringing that home and saying, I'm the boss here. Yeah. This is yeah. my life and I'm in yeah. charge of it. Yeah. That we yeah. don't, that in fact, that's what we're actually doing. We're taking charge of our life rather than ha being the child victim that was yeah. dependent upon all of these other people to make me feel the way that I want to feel. Rather yeah. than recognizing I can do that myself. I can feel any way that I want to when I yeah. remember. It's a pretty dangerous proposition. <laughs> it, it is dangerous. This is part of the problem uh, that people can uh, hear the Dhamma and fall into wrong view. Mm. Now, mm. what is wrong view can be stated as I can get what I want and get away with it. I can do mm. anything I want to do and get away with it because they'll hear the part of the, the teaching of that you're responsible, you could get what you want, and that you're not uh, subject to the past. Mm -hmm. But ordinary right view is a very conservative view. Mm. It's the conservative view of, oh, if you do good, you'll get good results, and if you do bad, you'll get bad results. Right. And there right. are people who have done good, and, and there should be examples for you, and there are people who have done bad, et cetera, like that. But basically what this means is, is that they set it up in the sense that you are bound by the past and bound by the future because you're bound mm. by the actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if we think that we are not bound by them, then that gives us the wrong attitude that we could get away with anything. We can harm people and go about that. Mm. But the Buddha teaches, no, there is good action that gives good results, and there is good bad action that gives bad results, but it's based upon conditionality, cause and effect. It's not based upon magic. Mm. There is something real in there that is not a super daddy or a sky daddy or uh, cameras everywhere that's going to punish mm. you. You're yeah. doing the punishment yourself. In your own mind. It's in your own mind, precisely. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, you bring these things together, these four things of wake up, look at what you're doing, make a change, and congratulate yourself. This congratulation mm. is also what we could call nurturing thought versus critical thought. Critical thought saying, <laughs> oh, well, you did this right, but you've got that wrong. Mm. Nurturing thought says everything is okay. What you did is just fine. Get over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But our critical system that we have in the West is, oh, no, we have to look for the good and the bad and the yeah. ugly. Yeah. Rather than yeah. just be satisfied without labeling things good, bad, and ugly. I'm okay with it. Right, right. We have our, um, our parent, as you say, our superego uh, monitoring our every moment. Mm -hmm. And not only just monitoring it, but setting it to a standard. Mm. And what we're doing here is investigating those standards. Mm. If they're real. We don't have to apply that standard. We can yeah. be nurturing instead. Yeah. And that standard is really the uh, hand on the, um, on the, uh, you know, the stovetop. And I recognize that I'm burning my hand. And I take it away. You know, right? That's the rational uh, choice, right? And we're talking about a rational decision about what we're doing to ourselves and what we're not doing to ourselves. Is that, mm -hmm. is that yes. why? But, but we have to look at that. We have to mm -hmm. do that evaluation and investigation mm -hmm. in order to see that this is not wholesome that I'm doing. Yeah. And wholesome is that which um, is... Uh, you know, contributing to sukha, contributing contributing to satisfaction, contributing to you know reality, contributing to my actual status. You know, that my actual state of being, and not the one that I uh, worry about or that I insist on, that I want, that I that uh, must be. Otherwise, you know, I I can't fulfill the agenda that has been introduced to me or that I insist on. Is does that follow? Yes. Mm. Okay, so when we bring these four items together, mm. 
especially the Samasankapa, the changing of the attitude. Mm. This mm. begins to gather things together and we become unified. Mm. We're no longer at a war with each other about setting rules that I can't manage. Mm. We stop criticizing ourselves mm. in the sense that the one who is criticizing is finding fault with that part of us that is being criticized. Mm -hmm. When we're nurturing, we come back together like a mom and an infant in her arms, as mm. opposed to a mom who's pointing her finger at the naughty child. Yes. Okay, that's the duality. Yes, yes. Okay, and so yep. we begin to bring together all of the constituent component parts. And this mm. is what makes the mind samadhi. The Buddha talks about it in, in the beginning of the sutta. He says, monks, listen carefully, and I will tell you about right unification of mind, right organization of mind with its supports and features. Mm. Mm. So what we've been talking about are the supports. Mm. The supports is wake up, look at what you're doing, Make a change and congratulate yourself. Wake up, take a look, make a change and congratulate yourself over and over and over and over again. And this mm. brings the mind into a state of unity mm. where you're not a crowd anymore. Mm. Okay, so let's look at that for a moment. And that is, is that when the mind is noble, when it's unified, when you're satisfied, when you don't want anything, then you're very unlikely to kill somebody to get it. Indeed. If you are whole and wholesome and noble and the mind is unified and you don't want anything, it's very unlikely for you to steal it. Yes. When you're at rest with all of the people and everybody that you're around, it's unlikely that you're going to start gossiping about a third person and telling lies. Yeah. And if you already feel really, really good, you don't need to go looking for some alcohol or something to make you feel good, some medicine or anything like that, that you're already okay. So our right. precepts, in fact, are not precepts saying this is a set of Buddhist rules that you're supposed to follow. When we think of it that way, that's ordinary Buddhism. When we mm. think of the precepts as those things that we can put our mind into mm. right here, right now. Mm. So here's an example of that. Let us say that the old Jewish rabbi is the kosher dude in town. And it's his job to kill every goat in town because mm. he's got to do it in a ceremony. He's mm. got to do it correctly because this is all Jewish and everything or Islamic if you want to go that route. Yeah. And this old rabbi comes out one day with his sharpened knife and there's that goat with a big smile on his face winking at the guy and he gets a heart. And he recognizes he can't kill that goat right now. He can't mm. do it. Mm. Mm. And he might th set that knife down and walk away from that goat. And he may never pick that knife up if he got that lesson that you can't go around killing. Mm -hmm. Even if it's part of our religion, even if it's done kosher, it's still killing. Yeah. And so he's going to stop because of his mind becoming noble. Right. He would have not stopped no matter what somebody. They could have wrestled him to the ground and said, don't kill that goat. And he'll get up with his knife and kill the goat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is how we do it is, is that it's not that we do it because it's a set of rules. Then, in fact, we set rules for kids because they're not wise or too stupid. And so we set the rules with punishment. We're saying yeah. that we're going to make sure that you understand that this behavior is dangerous. And yeah. so we create artificial dangers. We make punishments for things mm -hmm. rather than having as natural outcomes. So we we our society is built upon a punishment model, mm. but the teachers of Buddha is built upon a rehabilitation model. Mm. I think uh, I recall you saying something to the effect that the Brahma Vihiras uh, follow the same uh, line of um, experience, you know, that they are a result of 
our, 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 yeah, our, our state, our experience, and not something that we're practicing, something we're trying to artificially manifest, you know, which would be essentially unwholesome, I guess. Uh, you know, but the wholesome result of our experience of being satisfied would be, you know, loving kindness, would be compassion, would be equanimity, would be, uh, I'm forgetting the fourth one, but. Uh, okay, God. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, sh shucks, I can't remember the English. Um, equanimity, right? Is that right? <laughs> I can't remember. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, a better word for it would be um, good balance, dynamic uh, balance. Uh, uh, okay, dynamic uh, balance. That's the uh, way of looking at it. And uh, uh, Tanisaro has, uh, Achan Tanisaro has given a very good example of that, and that is the doctor. A uh, good doctor has loving kindness for his patients. That's why he's a uh, doctor. He wants to do something good. Uh, when he is with a patient who has a disease, it's possible for him to catch that disease. That would be mm. real compassion. If somebody mm. is sick with a disease, the only way that you can be with them in their mm. passion is to get sick with them. Yeah. To have a pity party with them. Mm. Yeah. Okay? If somebody is angry, they want everybody around them to be angry. Right. Misery right. loves company. Yeah. The doctor's got to make sure that he stays safe so that he does not catch the disease. I mean, this was very common with the COVID when it first started, is all the nurses were getting sick with COVID. Right. Big they time. weren't taking the correct precautions to stay yeah. out of it. Okay. Yeah. So real compassion means that you don't get sick. Mm. Okay. And so the mm. mudita, the third one, is giving the actual cure. Mm. The real mm. cure, which in our case would be joy, would be happiness, would be satisfaction. So we actually work with people who are in a pity party to help them to cheer up and to come out of their pity party. Rather mm. than join them and say, you've got a right to feel bad. It, it, ain't it awful that he beat you up or whatever. So yeah. A better way to say it is, huh, that's not a much of a bruise at all. Mm. It's just and, a little bruise. You got out of that really easily. Okay. Right. So and, that's and, Mudita, sympathetic joy. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I'm just, uh, I was saying it, it reminded me, what you were saying just reminded me of uh, what uh, you talked about that the Buddha taught two things. Dukkha and um, Dukkha Naroda. And Dukkha. what you're speaking to, I think, is the Naroda. Right. And you're talking about expressing that experience, not only in your own, you know, personal experience, but how you're helping other people with it. Right. I mean, right. Exactly. <clears throat> so that would be the, the friendship that's on that's mm -hmm. both sides. The inside is, is that I can come and nurture myself and feel really good. And mm -hmm. then I can go over and be around people who are miserable and help them to feel good, too, without mm -hmm. getting sick with the disease that they have mm. okay and would you call that a gladdening of the mind right i mean is it the gladdening of their minds yes i mean uh when i smile people smile <laughs> right. when i joke and grin they grin too it's yeah it's, yeah it's a sympathetic vibration if i come on really tough and angry like that and tell you how bad the united states government is and how this political party is terrible and they do this that and the other thing then you'll feel that way too yeah. if you're not mindful if you're not awake so yeah. when people feel a certain way and they want other people to feel that way the other people do and feel that way in sympathetic vibration but here we're turning the tables around on that yeah. we're not going to feel the way that they feel we're going to continue to hold our joy and let that rub off on them rather than their misery rubbing off on us. Yeah, and it's not an affirmation. It's really, it's really just an acknowledgement of the fact that you're capable of seeing the thoughts that are, that are unwholesome, that are dissatisfying, and returning your experience to what is satisfying, returning your experience to reality, which is mm -hmm. not the dissatisfaction, which is not the unwholesome 
uh, thought and it, the training and the skill is to, to continually return to that, to continually repeat that until it becomes your general experience. Is that, does that follow? Yeah. Yes. So now let's look at Upeka. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the doctor again, going back to the analogy of the doctor, as <clears throat> much as they want to cheer up their patients and get them well, some of the things that the doctor does actually is detrimental, and he sometimes kills their patients. In fact, more people die in the hospital than any place else. That's a good reason mm. right there to never go to a hospital. That's where you go to die. The doctors are waiting there to do it to you. Okay. Now, here's the point. This is all still in ignorance. We don't have medical science down yet. And the, mm. and the proof of that is, is that every patient that every doctor has ever had dies. Mm. Some of the patients will outlive the doctor, but most likely the doctor is going to outlive a lot of old people that die right on his hands. Mm. Right. How does the doctor feel when he loses his patients one after another after another? Is he mm. going to be strong minded? Is he going to be able to handle that? Or is he going to have something we call in our society now burnout? Mm. Teachers burnout, psychologists burnout, um, uh, social workers burnout, nurses burnout, doctors burnout, mm. cops burnout, and burn up. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Okay. All mm. of these helping professions wind up having burnout because the individual that is practicing prof profession doesn't have control over his own mind when he loses it. Mm -hmm. The doctors lose their patients, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have the sea legs to be able to handle the fact that the deck that we're on is up and down and up and down, and sometimes we lose and sometimes we win. Right. And so uh, this brings another analogy of um, uh, how to balance. Imagine the old uh, sea captain on his uh, big fishing boat mm. and hi in high seas, and he's going mm. from the bow to the stern, he can make it. Mm. But if you have a uh, landlubber who has no sea legs, and he's sitting on the bow of that ship with the captain, and the captain goes to the stern in high seas, the landlubber is not going to make it. He's either <laughs> going to heave over the side or go over the side or bang into the cabin wall or try to grab <laughs> some ropes to stand up. Because he can't handle it. That's right. Hey, uh, Domerata, would you excuse me for one moment? Okay. I'm so sorry. I have to use the okay, restroom. Don't be sorry. Just go do what you want. Don't take 10 Thank minutes to apologize. Just do it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh. So sorry. What a what a clear example of Opeka that just happened. Oh yeah. Okay, yes. Then in fact here we were rocking along with the Dom and all of a sudden something in the other room gives a great big ground swell. And here you go up and down like that and you didn't <laughs> And so you start apologizing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to go take care of something instead of just say, I'll be right back and just go do it. Mm, mm. But in and our the society, we got to apologize. We got to be sorry. 
Mm. And the apology is uh, an element of uh, what we're talking about when we're discussing dissatisfaction, where we're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, how we upset ourselves. Right, which just happened. You upset yourself because you had to leave our conversation for a short right. time. Right, right, right. Well, I think if I, I, I really hope that we continue talking and I get to know you better and I'll trust the fact that I can just say, I'll be right back. <laughs> because usually, usually I have to apologize so I don't offend somebody. You know what I mean? Right, so. exactly. Well, you can't offend me, so. Okay, why, okay. Why is that is because the opaca that your, your groundswell of leaving the room, I'm okay with that. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank but you. just because I lost my patient doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> okay. You died on me, but you came right back. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm glad I'm back. I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is what we have as opaca, is mm. the ability to handle the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. We learn to mm. not be the target. Mm. The doctor has to learn that the patient died. It wasn't him that died. Right. And would Opeka be um, a quality of Sati? I mean, if I have the skill of Sati. Precisely. I mean, have so, sa sa so Sati is not awareness. Sati is a remembering. Mm -hmm. And Opeka is awareness? No, opaca is the outcome of your ability to handle anything that comes. Mm. Okay, because I because I'm I have the capacity to not identify with what happens. I have the capacity to not, um, you know, say that the things that are happening in my own mind are me. That these are things that are uh, taking place. They're reactions. They're moments of dissatisfaction. They're not what I would call myself. Another way of doing it or thinking about it is, is that opaca is the time to not apply the rules. Okay. Okay. Like, don't apply the rule of gravity. Mm. Just because the deck went down doesn't mean you got to go down with it. Mm. Okay. Mm. So okay. what happened though was, is that you decided to, put in a rule. What was the rule? Thou shalt not leave Damarato <laughs> and go to the other room. Thou shalt not do that. <laughs> That's a big one. Thou shalt not leave Damarato. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one. I barely know you. That's a big one. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, that's the whole point is you're not supposed to leave. And so yeah, when you have a yeah. uh, instead of the reality is, is that you need to go do something. So go do it. Yeah. <laughs> instead of making it against some rule or something. And so this right. is the whole thing about the uh, the uh, the super ego is look at all the rules that we create for ourselves, because that's yeah. what keeps us out of balance. And or we, we hurt have any rules to apply then we're okay. And we hurt ourselves, right? We're, we're hurting ourselves, essentially, right? We're, you we're, broke we're, a rule. You we left broke Yeah, you know. Not I, only I'm so, that, but you broke I'm so rules. bad. <laughs> you broke another <laughs> one because you, you knew in advance that you had to leave Damarato. So here you are apologizing about breaking a rule that you just broke and now breaking a new one by leaving. <laughs> bad, bad Greg, <laughs> right? Bad Greg. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, and, and so that's that's the point is is to stop with all of this critical thinking. Yeah, and be here now. Right, right, and that's the stop. Right, that's the story about the stop. The finger hunter or whatever his name was, I forget now. But that's you know the guy wanted the Buddhist finger. That's the point of the story, right? I mean, that's the point of the story is you're is you are stopping. You are deciding. To no longer participate in the, you know, uh, yeah, the rules and the compulsion and the training and, you know, the you, you must do this now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, I hear that and I agree with that and I completely see it and I experience it. But I also would not choose to be disrespectful to you. I would not choose to be uh, impolite. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I mean, that's not the same thing, right? Well, 
actually, I don't see anything like there. I would say uh, an example of being rude or impolite would be like some of the comments that we get, like, who the hell do you think you are? Because mm, mm. I've had those kind of comments. I or see. others would say, I would like for you to be a teacher, but I disagree with you on this point or that point. Yeah, right. Okay, so saying that you don't agree or that you don't like something with someone, that's actually, if you think about it, that's impolite in all society. That's being rude everywhere. Yeah. When you try to <laughs> confront people with what they've done wrong as an introduction. They don't, right. out of the blue comes this, you know, <laughs> giant right. criticism. Right, right. That's without. Rudeness. Without an actual engagement, without actually, you know, dialoguing with that individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so criticizing another person is rude. That I mean, that's. A, because they take it as feeling like that you've offended them, being yeah. offensive. Yeah. And I, and I think you had mentioned in one of your other uh, talks you know, about bad speech and how bad speech has really you know, not making bad speech is what has solidified and maintained the Sangha. You know, that there is this important element of not making bad speech, even if somebody does something wrong, it's not your business. It's, not, you know, and and making bad speech is just starting to kind of, um, uh, you know. Uh, separate. It, yeah, That's separate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not that's not what we're looking for, right? And that's not that's not the goal. Even if you don't understand or you don't agree, it's no excuse to make bad speech, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if that's true on the outside, isn't it also true on the inside? Yeah, I'm making myself yeah. unhappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I criticize right? it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So there's where those rules are. That if mm. we make rules, then we'll criticize ourselves for breaking them, and we'll also criticize other people for breaking them. Yeah. Instead of if we don't have any rules, then we're not criticizing anybody. Yeah, right. And that's, I, it, to me, if I understand it correctly, that's where we can be active. You know, we can't act, be active in feeling because feeling is automatic. You know, but we can be active in uh, how we crave and how we cling. Like when we, if I, I don't know a lot about this, but I'm trying to understand, but dependent origination has these elements that are not really in our control and these elements that we can begin to achieve control. And the, the control is. And mm. as we do that, we begin to get quicker and faster. And so we begin to back into time that repetitive cycle. And so what we could do is we can get into the cycle quicker and quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. This is the teaching. And so the Paticca Samapada is taught in forward order, but it's practiced in reverse order. Mm -hmm. uh, a clear example of that would be if you're in an argument with someone, when do you wake up that you're in an argument with someone? When you start oh, to I yell? When you right. get the knives out? <laughs> when you right. get into a duel, yeah. When right. you're trying to bury a bed body, I mean, how long? How long does the argument go? Right. Or does somebody eventually figures out that this isn't the right thing, and so they slam the door on the way out? The yeah. final word is the slamming of the door. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now, if we've got mm. that, then mm. we can really start applying the Dhamma. And recognizing that how many bad words or how many argumentative words are you going to say before you wake up to this argument? And can mm. you shut your mouth after you've only said seven dirty things? Yeah. Can you wake up after you say three thirty dirty things? Can yeah. Can you wake up after you said one dirty thing? In other words, an outburst, an expletive, a damn. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What the hell are you doing? Okay. Yeah, you know, right in the you, middle of that outburst, you could wake up then. That's getting pretty fast to wake up, okay? And and so that's when we shut up. Yeah, or you know, we can have the thought, but we don't let it out at all. We mm -hmm. shut up, 
before that argumentative word comes out. Mm. And now we have time to change our attitude. Mm. And that attitude change would be what we speak about when we're saying gladdening the mind. Mm. Is that gladdening correct? The mind has many different attributes to it. One is that it changes the way that we feel, and it also changes our mental attitude slowly over time. And it's not an affirmation. It's not something I'm making up. It's not a fantasy. It is something that is becoming, uh, it's something to represent the reality of my experience. It is. The reality is I don't have to argue with her right now. Yeah. The, argument, right. or the reality is I'll feel better if I stop arguing and start smiling. Yeah, the reality is I don't have to suffer. The reality is I don't have to put up with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No, I see that. Okay, so we're dealing with reality. The reality is I don't have to say anything. Yeah. But if because I do, if we're I'm gonna get into trouble. Better to shut my mouth. Yeah, I, I know that well. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm I I uh yeah. Yeah, I mean anything else would take us into more of a magical uh, perspective, right? You know, where we're making things up and we're in, you know, kind of what you speak about in terms of affirmations and how that doesn't actually fulfill the, uh, you know, the tenets of what we're, we're addressing, right? We're talking about wholesome and unwholesome. Unwholesome is actually really more of the magical and wholesome is more of the reality. The reality, exactly. Let's get mm. real here. Mm. But in mm. fact, that, that word of uh, to see the reality, see the truth of the situation is what we wake up to. Mm. Rather than the hindrances is how bad can things be? How, yes. you know? Yes. So we, we come well, out of that negative thinking into looking at how good things are actually right now. Yes. I think you say what if isms, right? Isn't that one what of your phrases? What if isms? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I borrowed so, that from the Republicans. <laughs> that's a good, that's, that's good. Very, I'm glad to hear that. About what about ism? <laughs> they need help. I think. Trump. You say, well, you did this. You says, well, what about that? And what about this over here? And what about them back there? You know, that's the what about ism. Right. It's nice. It's nice that there's something wholesome coming from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Good. But we do it. We make right. excuses and we say, well, what about this and what about that? And sometimes yeah. what about it uh, is good and we feel, but I'm not that. Or then yeah. we say, what about uh, something that's bad? And we say, oh, no, it could happen. Yeah. And so our what about isms are actually delusional thinking. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you know, I, I heard you talk about how you know, our thinking is generating feelings. And we can change how we feel by wholesome thinking. Is is the opposite true? Do we have feelings that precipitate how we think? And you know, oh, absolutely. Mm. Yes, they're very okay. interconnected. Mm. Um, uh, that in fact, never mind where a feeling comes from. When mm. we're in that feeling, it will cloud our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we feel angry, our thoughts will be angry. They will be clouded by that feeling. Mm -hmm. They're not different. They're not different. That's right. That's they're, 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 they're they're rising. They're rising the together. They're rising together. Well, at least in in uh, in, in in a way that a fuse lights a bomb. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the fuse came first, but the fuse can be pretty short. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so that's the whole idea of cause effect, and mm. that the body conditions the feelings, the feelings condition the mind, the mind conditions the feelings, the mind conditions the body, all psychosomatic, it's all wrapped mm. together. But in order to understand that correctly, we have to pull these things apart and get a good handle on what is the body? How do I work with it? What are the feelings? How do I work with them? What is the mind? 
because in fact that's the procedure that we figure out oh the mind can control the feelings the mind has influence over the body the mm. body has influence over the mind and over the feelings an example mm. of that is if you're sitting in a posture that's uncomfortable then the mind will be uncomfortable mm. the feelings right. will be uncomfortable because the body is uncomfortable if we rearrange the body so that it is comfortable then that will help the mind become comfortable but in order yeah. to rearrange the body to be comfortable we have to have the thought let me rearrange the body to make it comfortable yeah, yeah. wow this stuff is all wrapped together <laughs> i mean it sounds it sounds to me like we make three things but we're actually talking about one thing mm -hmm. is well, that true or? This, that, right well you can say a three-legged stool is a one thing three-legged stool yeah but it's not the same thing with one of the legs missing so we yeah. have to understand each of these three legs and that stool. That right. way we can really understand it as a whole is because we see how things fit together. Yeah, but they're all sort of interrelated and and there's no way of unrelating them. Well, uh, that's what we mean by uh, general systems theory. And you could say that the Buddhas are <clears throat> teaching a Paticca Samuppada directly is general systems theory mm, now general okay. systems theory has to do about is the system open or is it closed what's the difference mm. between an open and a closed system for instance the planet earth is an open system why mm. is that because it's got radiation from the sun bombarding it on a regular basis if you close that system what would happen if you stopped having any daylight coming to the planet earth Bad news. Bad news. So you want to keep that <laughs> system open. Yeah. With the human body, we can see it as sometimes it's open and sometimes it's closed. Sometimes we want to put it in a closed position so that we, we can do the repair work on the inside. Mm. That's mm -hmm. what we mean by solitude, is getting the mind away from all of the outside influences so that we can do the repair job. Uh, a, a clear example they talk about it of building an airplane while it's in flight mm. or another one would be doing an overhaul of an engine in a race mm. mm -hmm. no you got to pull over to the side of the road to repair <clears throat> the engine yeah we need to get ourselves into seclusion that way so that's one of the uh the points that we're talking about but another one is to recognize that the body the feelings and the mind are influencing one another mm. and that we need to see those influences. Mm -hmm. We need to see it that way that, oh, if I change my posture, I can't change the posture of the body without changing the posture of the mind. The mind is a mm. forerunner for everything. But once I change the posture of the body and it feels good, now I can feel good. Now I can relax mm. and the mind can relax. Okay, so these things are directly related with each other. Yeah. And to see that in a relationship is uh, the actual practice of Anapanasati. In other words, how can you get the body relaxed if the mind is tensed up? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we have to, in order to relax the body, we have to have relaxing thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To just relax. And when you you speak about relaxing thoughts, you're speaking about thoughts that indicate our actual experience, not indicate the experience we would like to have. Right. What am Is I that correct? Right now. Exactly. Right now. Right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm using my cognitive faculty to indicate the quality of my experience. Is that correct? Yes. So let us say that we're in some sort of dialogue internally, to, uh, and it can be many, many examples. An example mm. would be, I want to go on a diet. And so mm. I agree I should go on a diet. And now yeah. all of a sudden I'm standing with the refrigerator door open and I'm in a war. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Right? I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Do I put that thing back in the refrigerator and shut the door and feel bad, or do I eat it and feel bad? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. so this is this is the war. When we get organized and unified, then whether we eat that thing in the refrigerator or not is is not the important thing. It's how we feel about what we're doing. Hmm. 
And if I can feel good and put it back in the refrigerator, that's better than feeling good and having to eat it. Then, in fact, mm-hmm. what I'm eating may not be all of that delicious. But often mm-hmm. we were told, and I was told this big time, I remember a big point about it when I was a kid, to eat what's on your plate. You eat yeah. what you're told to eat. You can't have dessert until after you eat. And what mom is saying is, is that I'm really sorry that the food that I made is doesn't taste good. Eat it anyway. Yeah, my my job is to raise you and make sure you eat your food. Right. Right. Okay. Right. And my mom used the one is that all of these food starving children in India, they're hungry, and here you have all of this food on your plate, and you want. And my and th- I was only four years old when I said this. I remember it. I says, "Here, mom, send this to India." <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I think uh, no matter how delicious the food is, all kids do that, right? You know, I mean, regardless, right? <laughs> yeah. We're picky yeah. little kids, yes. Picky, exactly. picky little buggers, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and mostly because we're afraid that we won't like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're afraid right. that we won't like it, and therefore we don't like it, mm-hmm. and we're afraid. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And we yeah. don't recognize it that, oh, wait a minute. I don't know mm. whether I like it or not. Let me give it a go. Let me mm. see what this is. Mm, yeah. Let me taste it and see without mm-hmm. rejecting it offhand. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we can do that without the food, though. We can see that's with life itself. Mm. Rather than having a bunch of rules and a bunch of fears and all of this, let's pay attention to what's going on. What's going on right now? Right now. What's happening right now? Right now. Right now. Like right now, what's the reality? of my experience and the thoughts that are indicating that experience, right? Mm -hmm. And the breath that you're taking is keeping you alive right now. Right, right, right. You don't take this next breath, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how immediate the breath is. That's how important it really is. Yeah, I think it's (laughs) life-giving. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, I think what I'm really trying to get you know, focused on and very clear on is the word unwholesome and the word and the and the phrase gladdening of the mind. Like that, those are the two things that I want to really be sure that I'm um, I'm practicing, you know, as carefully as I can, because I, I think if I'm on, if I understand correctly, I think I understand. Right. I think I understand Sati. I think I understand right attitude. I, you know, I think I think I think I understand right effort. Maybe I don't, but I want to, you know, I, you know, I see that when I'm aware. I OK, let me say. OK, this. all right, I'll stop. <laughs> and that is that these are all skills to be developed. Mm. Knowing whether a thought is wholesome or not is a skill to be developed. Mm. That it is possible that you can say a group of words and that group of words in that order is wholesome and you can say the same words and they're unwholesome. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's what makes it a little complicated is the words that we're using doesn't determine the, whether it's wholesome or not. It has to do with our attitudes and our feelings about those words. Okay. It's like almost the context. Right. It's the context. Okay. So the next thing is, is that uh, because this is a skill to be developed, there are a few unwholesome thoughts that we know for sure, absolutely without a doubt, these are thoughts that are unwholesome. Mm, yeah. Thoughts of going out and killing a politician. Thoughts of cruelty, mm. being cruel to an animal. Okay. Yep. This would be unwholesome. Thoughts of wanting stuff that we don't have is a little bit more difficult to understand mm. that that's an unwholesome thought. Yeah. Okay. So yep. the next one is that there are going to be some thoughts that we do know that are going to be absolutely wholesome without a doubt. No doubt about it. This thought is going to be a wholesome thought. Like, wow, what a relief it is. Okay. Yeah. Now. 
Yeah. There is a wide variety of things in between, and it is your job to keep investigating, keep looking, keep noticing so that you can figure out for yourself what is wholesome and what is not wholesome. Okay. This is a skill to be developed. It's not a question that can be answered. Okay. So wakey, wakey, keep looking, uh, okay. keep noticing. Okay. And uh, recognizing that some thoughts are just downright unwholesome. There's other ways that you can help understand this, and that is thoughts about the past and thoughts about the future are generally mm. not wholesome. That doesn't mean that they're always not wholesome. That, in fact, I do have to do a visa once a year. Mm. If I think about that visa months in advance, that's unwholesome mm. because the data that they're looking for needs to be current. So mm. I should not think about getting a, a, a physical exam until the week of the visa. Mm -hmm. So thinking about things off into the future. Another example of that one would be I've got to go to the bank. Yeah. How many times do I go to the bank in my mind without ever actually going to the bank physically? <laughs> right. Know that one. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that those all, all those unwholesome thoughts about going someplace and doing something and then not actually doing it is unwholesome. Yeah. Yeah. Writing an email, thinking about writing an email and then not writing the email is unwholesome. It's better to think about writing an email while you're writing the email. <laughs> <laughs> Would uh, any wholesome thought ever generate dukkha? For somebody else, probably. But for you? But generally, it would be changing that wholesome thought into an unwholesome thought, and then the Duke of Cops. Okay, okay. Well, we, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I reflect that I'm, as I learn more about um, what you're teaching, I was reflecting on, uh, I think it's the first chapter of the, the, uh, shucks, uh, the, the um, collection of the Buddha sayings, the Dhamma. Um, Dhammapada. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. And the first one, I think it's the twins, right? And it's talking about these two different ways of thinking. And he opens that up with wholesome and unwholesome thinking. And in uh, to be honest, until I started uh, following what, what you were talking about, I don't think I really understood that at all. Mm -hmm. You know, because it was always about like, well, just, you know, get rid of your thinking and, you know, discard your thinking and suppress your thinking. And, uh, you know, but it's actually more about, you know, how you're you're defining your thinking and qualifying your thinking and monitoring how you think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So stopping what you're thinking is a highly developed skill. Let me let me use this example. This one fits for a lot of people. What's the difference between a wild stallion mm. that has a complete freedom and goes wherever he wants mm -hmm. versus a very, very high quality of a trained prancing horse? What's the difference? Mm. Uh, I think a lot of time and effort, I suppose, it's skill, training, well, that the, kind of thing. The training, I mean, the, the, the wild yeah. horse put a lot of wild effort, time and effort out there, and he's still wild. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Basically, what we're talking about is the difference between a wild stallion that's out in the wild versus a trained animal is the boundaries that we set around the animal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if the horse is in uh, the wild, then he goes wherever and does whatever. But if he's fenced into a pasture, then he has to stay within that pasture. Yeah. So that pasture has got all kinds of green food and, and wonderful, and it's really great for the horse. And if he stays in that pasture, everything is cool. Mm. Now, the next point is, is bringing the, uh, the, the horse for training into the corral. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that means with the mind that uh, in the beginning, the mind is all over the place. Yeah. 
And then we add a whole sub thoughts is like putting up fences, putting up a boundary. There's places mm. you don't go anymore. That's dangerous mm. over there. You don't go into that ravine. You don't go into that thicket. You don't go into that cesspool. You stay within your boundaries. Mm. And then we bring it down to a, a, a corral where the horse could actually be trained. Mm. So we could do that uh, uh, with the mind also down to the point that to, and actually to work with the horse, let us say a, a, a vet or uh, whatever, because I was raised when I was in Oklahoma around animals like that. And you want to put them in a stall. If you get that animal in a stall, now you have control over it. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So. How that works with the mind is, is that unwholesome, wholesome thoughts mixed is just all over the map. Mm -hmm. We bring it down to put it into a pasture, which is all wholesome. Then we put it down into a corral, which be be like the uh, the length of a song or a particular chant or something mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. then to further refine the mind, to put it down into a uh, stall, would be like giving uh, the mind a mantra. Mm -hmm. So the wild mind is all over the place. A mantra is not going to do that student any good. He's got to mm -hmm. be able to get the mind a little bit under control by putting it into a pasture, mm -hmm. by putting it only through some thoughts. Then we put it down to saying the same little group of things over and over again. And in fact, I've got one that uh, was quite surprising. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever heard of Revel? Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever heard of, um, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, Bolero. Yes. One of his pieces of music. It starts. I've, he I've heard of it. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> it. It starts with a drum beat and then the, the, the orchestra uh, starts up mm. pieces at a time. Mm. But it starts with this rhythm. Dup, da 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 Mm -hmm. da, 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 okay yeah. now what happens is is that in that third group it changes the dot into a triplet so it's whole note triplet whole note triplet whole note triplet 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 whole note Da, 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 da. I'm doing that. What kind of thoughts are you having? Uh, they were they were diminishing. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So that's the idea of putting the mind into a corral, and we can do that with a mantra. Or we could do it with a verse mm. that we practice mm. and say it over and over again, or we can do it even with a musical beat like that. It's just complicated enough that we have to think about it. If we had a beat that was just dot da 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 dot that we're gonna lose it and the mind's just gonna go all over the place. But this little bit of complexity where it's dot da 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 dot da 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 dot da 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 dot da 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 dot da 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 dot da 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 dot okay you do that for about five minutes and you'll really begin to see what the mind is doing. Because you're paying attention to that mantra, and yet over and over again, these thoughts keep leaking in. Mm. And you begin to see those things. You begin to really get fast with what you're doing because you've got that standard. You've got that boundary. You've got mm. that framework. You've got that song that you're singing. Or in this case with Bolero, you've got that beat, that complicated beat. Dot, mm. triple it, dot triple it dot triple it triple it triple it dot mm -hmm. yeah. right so one thing has changed in that but it makes it complicated enough that we have to keep focused on it but while we're while we're focusing on it you can begin to see what else the mind is doing because it's jumping around the mind is a pretty fast thing and this is uh helping us to more and more clearly see the unwholesome thinking to see the unwholesome tendencies and nature of the mind is that mm -hmm. is that true right. yeah right exactly 
Mm. And so this is the value of doing those kind of things so that eventually, like with Boo on the in-breath and Doe on the out-breath, that mind is so, uh, let us say, settled down, where it's only down to two words. Mm. That's easy now to bring it down to no words at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. a training. Yeah. And yet so many Westerners say, oh, you're supposed to stop the mind, and then they think they can do it. That's like saying, oh, you can go 200 miles an hour. Yeah, you can if you have a race car. Mm. You've got to go build a race car first before mm. you do 200 miles an hour, okay? Or you need to develop the skills to be able to stop the mind. And yeah. the way to stop the mind is by slowing it down, by giving it something very repetitive to do. And the first thing that we work with is the repetition of only having wholesome thoughts, whatever they mm. are, over mm. and over again. But it gives us a lot of variety within that. Mm -hmm. So this and is the way that we practice is by getting wholesome thoughts, wholesome thoughts, wholesome thoughts, and then start narrowing those wholesome thoughts down, mm. then narrowing them down further until there's only such a few different thoughts left that those are easy enough to deal with. Mm. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, refining our uh, capacity to be aware that we're, we are no longer um, uh, afflicted by unwholesome thoughts. And we have kind of this complete, you know, we have a, you know, a capacity to be aware without them, in a sense. We're not trying to stop thinking necessarily, but it's, it's just a matter of refining. We're learning to control the mind. Stopping the mind is only just one way of saying controlling the mind. Mm. We're but we're not to control the mind and let's control it in whatever way we can until we get to the point that we've got the skills to the point that we can actually stop it. And but stopping it would be not necessarily something that you would do as part of how you would engage your life. It's something that's indicating that you have the capacity to be able to do that and separate yourself from unwholesome thinking. Well, right. Now, let's put one more point to it, and that is, is that the thoughts that we have, we're talking about thoughts that are discursive thoughts, mm. thinking thoughts that have words. Okay. But we have a lot of other kinds of thoughts, too. Mm -hmm. The thoughts of sensual awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, an example of that would be a diamond cutter while he is examining that diamond and about to put the chisel on, he's watching what he's doing. His thoughts are not discursive thoughts, they're mm. observational thoughts. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's another thing is, is that when we get away from the discursive thoughts, then we can do more observational thoughts. Mm. Okay, like observing yeah. directly how we feel. So first we talk ourselves into feeling good, and then we stop talking to ourselves about how good we feel and actually experience how good mm. we feel. Different kind of mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we have to make sure that, in fact, if you're aware of the headphones that are on your head, first one ear and the other, while you're thinking about that, you're not talking to yourself about the headphones. You're actually experiencing the headphones mm. as they're sitting there with the weight and the other things. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is there are more than one kind of thought, and yet we generally think of it as only as discursive thoughts, word mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. Most of your thoughts are not words at all. They're almost like uh, random thoughts, you know, just think thoughts They're that think themselves. That. Random thoughts are much more of uh, discursive. No, we're talking about observational thoughts. What the diamond cutter. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. You're watching what's going on. And also when you're breathing in and experiencing the breath, you're actually watching the breath, monitoring the breath. That's a form of thinking. Mm, yes. But we're not talking. We're just observing mm -hmm. so it's if an intent it, and you see something in the distance and you don't know quite what it is you'll hone in on it and look you're not thinking while you're doing that not discursive thoughts you're actually looking with your eyes and right. looking takes time that right. looking is a mind moment 
or yeah. two or three or four that has no discursive thoughts in it at all. You go around stopping your mind from discursive thoughts on a regular basis. Yeah. But we think that we're thinking all the time. No, we're not thinking discursive thoughts all the time. Most of the time that we're thinking is observational. Being yeah. in our senses. Yes. Yes. So when you hear a big noise, you're actually hearing the noise. And then we start thinking about what that could be. We try to identify what that sound is. Right. So there's right. the two kinds of thinking is one is mm -hmm. hearing it. And then number two, trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. That trying to figure it out is the discursive thought. Almost the conceptualization. Conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are the thoughts that we're putting down, and we're doing that by doing observational thinking instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is one like if we're? I'm just trying to learn more about this now. But is one more related to consciousness in terms of just in indication of the experience, and then we add a conceptualization on that experience, and then that becomes a conceptualization. When you talk about consciousness, we have to make sure that we're talking about what kind of consciousness. Mm. Sense consciousness mm. is what mm. we're actually going for, is the consciousness of, in the mind moments it takes to be conscious of, some sort of input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that input either can come from the outside input, like with the eyes and the ears and, and the touch and all of that with the body, the five senses, or that input can come from old garbage that's in the mind already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My memory systems from the past. The sankaras. The sankaras, precisely. Mm -hmm. So the okay. sankaras will, will bring up uh, um, constructive or, or discursive thoughts, just like uh, um, any observation will be. And so the practice that we're talking about is to come out of those um, Sankara-related thoughts into the reality. Because mm -hmm. what you see with your eyes is real right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. What you think about what you see is not real. It's conceptualizations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So knowing that difference, we begin to spend more and more time in observation and less and less time in analysis. Mm -hmm. And that would be that step after gladdening the mind, that step after um, uh, uh, generating a wholesome uh, wholesomeness to the mind. Is that true? That that would be and kind of the observing the results of that, which would mm. be satisfaction and safety and security and comfort, those kind of things as the reality as your reality as your reality not as something you make up like uh, somebody who does an affirmation like i'm okay it's more like i am okay like the actual experience of being okay is your satisfaction because i'm okay doesn't believe it yeah right 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 yeah so it's coming into tune with reality as you say it's coming into tune with our actual direct experience. Well, in and this the, case, we're creating our reality. Mm. One created, I'm okay with a high pitched voice and doesn't really meet it. His reality is, I'm just saying it to get away from you. Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. the, oh, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. It's a different. Yeah. And it's almost like seeing reality as it is, like you were saying. I guess, you know, I mean, it's like, really actually indicating that the reality is that I'm okay. The, right. And also yeah. with the knowledge that you have the power to create your own reality. This is the um, Sama, uh, uh, Sama Sankapa or the right attitude is, is that you know that you're creating your own reality and you've got a choice about it. Mm, meaning that I can choose, I, I can follow an unwholesome reality or I can follow the wholesome reality as it truly exists. Well, the distinction that we're caught on here is that the reality uh, is not a, the real reality is not a feeling. 
Mm. The real reality is just thusness, just that's how it is. Mm. But how we feel is our constructed reality. Mm. Mm. We have a choice over what kind of constructed reality that we're going to make out of the actual reality that's there. And this is the, the, uh, is it Pasa, the contact, and then the Vedana, no, the feeling? Before, before Pasa. Oh, before, before. Before, the, before it contacts you, what is it that contacts you? So here's the way of, of uh, speaking about that. And that is, is that when we receive input from the outside, it by itself, without anything else, is just a data point, and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Okay. What yeah. we do with it is we take that piece of information and add it to stuff from our past in order for understanding. Understanding is perception. In other words, what we see, we don't know at all. We have to figure it out, and the way that we figure it out is either by more in, uh, more sense consciousness taking it in keep looking at it in reality but what most people do is they see what they saw and then try to add something from their past to it to figure out what it is yeah and so our our um result which is uh in the poly is the um saliatana the internal representation of the external mm. is is mired by our past mm. Mm -hmm. rather than taking new data and taking new data and taking new data and taking new data would be the right way to do it we take in data try to figure it out based upon our past and come up with an understanding that may not knit reality very well let me give you an example of this mm. two guys are standing on a street corner and they see somebody coming down the street that's dressed in a certain way and each of these two guys that see that person dressed in that certain way have a completely different reaction to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the example that I use is, is that somebody is walking down the street in a nun's habit. Mm -hmm. And one guy who got spanked by a nun when he was in school, he's going to hate her automatically. Oh, there's that old nun coming down the street and he doesn't know anything about it other than he sees the nun's habit and matches that with his past mm -hmm. the other guy may be in seminary and he's all mm -hmm. gaga about the catholic religion and everything and so when he sees a nun he's has great respect for her yeah now let's have a third guy who comes on the scene and he looks at what's going on and he takes another look and recognizes that this is not a nun at all it's a halloween costume <laughs> right yeah right but yeah. the other two guys, they put their past into it, and both of them missed. Yeah. Because they weren't taking in new data and taking in more new data and taking more new data and living in reality. That that's, the rea that's what we're talking about here is that we keep adding our past into it, thinking that if we add our past to the present, the result will be understanding. That's often not the case. Yeah. So those folks, those guys needed the sati skill promoted. They needed the sati skill to become awake, to wake up, and keep to, looking, to, and to keep wake looking, up. Keep... And and could we say that their applica the, the application of their ideas was unwholesome and that the application of the person who was awake was wholesome? Is that, could we say that? I, I would say that unless instead of using the word wholesome here, let's use the word appropriate. So okay. if someone's coming down the street in a Halloween costume, it's not appropriate for somebody to come up and hit them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, it's not appropriate for somebody to come up to the guy in the Halloween costume and bow and scrape and, and uh, treat him right. like a holy person. Both of right. those things are not appropriate. I guess what I'm trying to understand is like when we say wholesome, are we talking about reality? Are we talking about new data are we talking about living in the present moment and not being completely consumed by our past whatever the past is whether it's 
something that was well, positive for us. Guys were, con were consumed by their past. They were just really smallly influenced by the past, and they didn't okay. recognize that they were influenced by the past. That's what's unwholesome, is that we don't know that we're making stuff up. Mm. So the wholesome is, is is intimately linked to sati. Intimately, we must. It, you you don't have a wholesome moment unless sati is present. Unless you're able to wake up and understand your direct experience. Mm -hmm. To wake up and look at what's going on. To look yeah. at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Look at mm -hmm. the fact that I'm hating someone in a Halloween costume, or I'm mm -hmm. gaga someone wearing a Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I. In fact, I've, I never met a nun who wasn't wearing a Halloween costume. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've I've heard you mention in some of your talks where you indicate that you know that uh, you know that idea, that thought, that experience, that unwholesomeness is not me, you know, and and I I think of all I've also heard you talk about. How well people will say, well, who are you? And you're saying, well, that's the wrong question. Good. You know, the wrong question, yeah. the wrong question. But but it, but there is still that indication that you are creating, you know, kind of like a, um, a, you know, sort of a distancing, you know, or or a capacity to be aware of something that's not you, right? Whatever you are, let's not ask the wrong question. Ask the right question. But there is that. You know, there is that uh, ability or skill to say, well, that's not me. Uh, in the particular sutra where the Buddha is talking about that, he's talking about it in the sense of unwise attention. Who mm. am I is an unwise attention. It's an unwise thought. It's mm. unwise in the sense of what was I in the past? What will I be in the future? Mm -hmm. What I am now that will bring mm -hmm. about that future and whatnot. And the Buddha says uh, that this is just a thicket of views. Yeah. Okay. That in fact, when people ask that question, who am I? Every time they ask it, it'll come up with a different answer. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned for people to do is to sit down and list, put on a list of things who you are and get a really good, clear definition of who you are. Mm. And then do that again tomorrow. Yeah. Compare those two lists and you'll see that they've changed. You're not yeah. the same person you were yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so the book yeah. says, well, what is wise attention? And what is wise attention is this is dukkha. Mm. This is the cause of dukkha. Mm. This is what it's like to be free from dukkha. And this is how I get there. This mm. is wise attention is the eightfold, no, uh, excuse me, the, is to see dukkha as dukkha, mm. not as me. Yes. I mean, I think uh, if I get the terms correctly, it's the difference between what is metaphysical and what is phenomenological. It's, you know, really just the direct experience as opposed to some metaphysical experience, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And in fact, in a way, you could say that metaphysical is not really the right word. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it is, and what we can say is, is that meta, in this regard, metaphysical, means outside of or above or surrounds physical mm, mm, mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as opposed to physical which is real okay mm -hmm. so physical is real and metaphysical is not real yeah almost by that definition yeah could we uh say that what is unwholesome is metaphysical Mm -hmm. And what is physical is wholesome in a sense. I mean, is that, you know, just to <laughs> play okay. a word game there, there for a second. That tree is out there. Mm. If I'm walking towards that tree and I see that tree and I recognize that this is a physical tree, I can walk around it. Yeah. If I, if I walk towards that tree saying this is not really a real tree, I know physical and I know metaphysics and then I'll just run right into it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what you say, how we just, we 
you know, essentially uh, make our, we, we're taught to make ourselves miserable and we make ourselves miserable. And that, and that is sort of a metaphysical proposition in a way, because it's not really, essentially, it's not really our real experience most of the time. Guess what? <laughs> You're right. We are taught to be metaphysical. We are taught mm. to be unhappy. Mm. How does that work? We're mm. taught that way. Well, actually, it has to do with, um, uh, scientifically, uh, we would call it imprinting. Mm. Mm. A more relaxed way of saying it, it'd be monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, we learn to be miserable by being around people who are miserable. And they teach yeah. you how to be miserable. And we as children grow up around other people who are unhappy. If your dad was like a Santa Claus and ho, ho, ho all the time, yeah. you'll have a completely different life than if your dad's a, a white beater. Right. Angry and a drunk. That's the whole yeah. point is, is the environment that we're living in creates a tremendous influence upon us when we're children. When are we going to stop letting the environment imprint us? When are we going to come out of our monkey see, monkey do and stop being imprinted by the unwholesome things that other people are doing? Yeah. Yeah. That's the question. The answer to that is a two-step process. You got to go do it in the on the inside by cleaning out all of the old imprints about all the old monkey see monkey do that we keep doing we saw that monkey do that 30 years ago and we're still doing it yeah it's so clear when you start looking for it you know uh just you know moment to moment second to second it's so clear you know i mean you just you just see these you know these factors come up and uh it's like putting your hand on that uh on that stove top and not taking it away and then you see it you're like oh shit you know, you take part of my French, you know, you take it away. And uh, no, the issue is, is that when are you going to put your hand back on that stove? Because you weren't mindful, knowing that it's hot, knowing that it burns. We've been burned one time and here we are putting our hand back on that stove again. Mm, yeah, because you forget. So Sati is to remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah. that that's yeah. was hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, the, it's interesting. I don't know if the Buddha ever speaks to this, but I do notice that in circumstances and environments, uh, this is uh, easier to do. And other environments or circumstances, it becomes much more difficult. I think I've heard you address that, like when you're angry, close your mouth, don't say anything. I thought about that <laughs> recently, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, there are certain times where I can definitely see it, but that, you know, it's not necessarily like gone, you know, and I'm just kind of going, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm in the middle of it right now, you know, and then there are other times where I see it and it's like, wow, you know, like, you know, Mara, I see you, bye-bye, you know, I mean, bye -bye. you know, <laughs> yeah, so th there are, you know, kind of the, the more intense circumstances and less intense circumstances, in my, you know, recent experience. <clears throat> and when the skill builds up, that means that we're taking the intensity out of things. Mm, mm, there's, there's no intensity. The intensity is always added as the extra feelings that we have. Right. Right. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that obviously, you know, in my experience, as the skill develops, the less impact these things have. And eventually the impact is almost unimpactful, you know, at least to some degree. I mean, I'm not you know, saying I'm, you know, completely uh, uh, there yet, but there's definitely some successes for sure. You know, so, no. Well, we've been at it for about two hours now. Thank you so much, sir. Good time to, to uh, take a break. And so, yes, uh, let's continue this at another time. Right. Be sure that you're practicing this. Be sure that you actually sit down and spend some time putting wholesome thoughts in, developing that attitude of, I can do this. I will. We'll see <laughs> you later then. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. I look forward to okay. talking to you again. All right. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>